Well, good morning, church, and thank you for not allowing Nate to keep you away. I'm not talking about our former student pastor, Nate Turner, our great groups leader and a family man. Speaking of weird families, by the way, we're in this challenging new series, My Weird Family. And if you weren't here because of the break and you're just joining us or if you're new to our church, the premise of this series between now and the holidays is simply this. I don't know that I've ever met a single person in my life that when you hear the word family, family, it doesn't strike some of the deepest chords in your heart and in your life. And yet as true as that is, you shake any family tree, and I absolutely guarantee you some nut or fruit will fall out. So last time we got together and we just admitted that we all came from a weird family. And if you didn't think you came from a weird family, that was weird. Because you've got work families and social families and neighborhood families and you've got biological families and blended families and step families and even the faith family, a beautiful mess called the Bride of Christ, the local church, West Cobb Church. And it gets complicated and it gets crazy. It gets whacked and it gets weird. And so we admitted that there's three things we can't do. Number one, you can't fix your family. Number two, you can't say to your son or your daughter, your mom, your dad, or your mother-in-law, you're fired. You can't fire your family. And thirdly, you can't totally free yourself from their influence. Families always make an imprint on our lives. So today we're going one more. It's a challenging time. And our great God is a good God, and we needed this rain, and I'm glad it's here. And today's a good day. And if you're new to church, you need to know God is a good God. Bad things happen to good people, and sometimes we don't understand, but our God is a good God. He's kind, he's compassionate, he's gracious. There was a time in world history where in the book of beginnings, it, it, it talks about this, that God was creating, bara, the word in Hebrew, created something out of nothing, this world this amazing planet. And here was the, his refrain. After his hands had created it, these words, it is good. Sun, moon, stars, good. Mountains, oceans, rivers, streams, good. Birds, plants, animals, good. Dogs, good. Cats, yes. Even Brussels sprouts, the duckbill platypus, and cats. God said, it is good. And then, suddenly, in the scriptures, you read, there was a moment in human history where God said, this isn't so good. In fact, it's in Genesis chapter 2, the Lord said, it is what? It is not good for man to be alone. He discovered that man was alone. He was living in isolation. He looked at Adam and said, oh, man, this isn't good. And so our great God, who when he sees a problem, goes to the solution side out of his great love, he creates Eve. Because he took one look at the man and said, I know I can do one better than this. No. He created Eve so that we never, ever have to be alone again. So we can do life together because we're better together than we are Alone, And yet all of us know because of brokenness, because of the fall of that first man, Adam, Adam and Eve, that we have this inheritance where we're broken and we're fallen. And so there's oftentimes in our lives where we choose to be alone and isolated and we hide. Let's face it, though, we are a culture of consumption. Cobb County is a county. Paulding County is a county of consumers. And consumers, by definition, consume things. Feed me, fix me, help me, take care of me, myself, and I. And that brings us to today. I, I promised we're going to talk between now and Thanksgiving about the six ways weird families work. Today, the number way, with God's help, that your weird family is going to work out all right. But to get there, I want to take us to a, a single passage of Scripture written by Paul, the great apostle, to a church located in a Grecian city called Ephesus. And we're diving into the Newer Testament chapter 4 of Ephesians. I'm reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. 
Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together in peace. It's a pretty cool verse that has a lot of implications for families. But then the Message Bible paraphrases it even more. It says, pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences, and quick at mending fences. If you'll stay tuned a few weeks, we're going to talk about mending fences. Today, I want to, we're going to highlight this conversation, alert at noticing differences. This idea of understanding that we have differences and we should be alert. We should have the gift of noticing. I promised today to talk to you about what men wish women knew, what women wish men knew, and what kids wish their moms and dads knew. So you'll want to take out your worship guide and take some notes along the way. It'd be a good time to do that. Uh, Weird families work. The number one way weird families work. Weird families work when me is we. Weird families work when me is we. You and I were created to be at our best when we're thinking about ourselves the least. I'm at my best when I'm thinking less of myself and more about my family and my God. To seek first me and my kingdom and all these other things will come your way. Someone defined humility as not thinking less of yourself but thinking of yourself less. That is we over me. One of the great uh, learnings over motivating individuals is to, first of all, be alert at who they are, that understand how they're wired. There are different wiring patterns for people, and there are different wiring patterns for men and women, for husbands and wives and children and grandkids. And yet, in our time that remains, I want to kind of lay these out. There are are three fundamental things that men wish women knew. Actually, there's a whole lot more than that, but we don't have three weeks to just talk about what men need. Number one, I hide my hurts. Men are hiders. Did you know this? We were raised to be rough and tough. When we were little, we got a boo-boo. We were, we were taught not to act like it hurt too much, and it, it didn't until mom sprayed Bactine on our wound, and then it hurt, and you couldn't hide it. So we hide our emotions. We regress. We hide our disappointment. We try to hide our wounds. Ladies, when we come home at night and we go to sleep in the lazy boy, we're, we're, we're kind of hiding out. And we we come at this quite naturally. Look in in the Genesis account. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they did what? They, They hid. But the Lord called to the man. See, this is one of the first results of the fall of Adam and Eve. They hid. They were naked and ashamed, so they hid. And men have been hiding ever since. Now, I'm, I'm eventually, when you go to heaven, there's a number of questions I want to ask God. It won't matter that much once I get there. But, but, but one of them is, why didn't, he, why didn't he say, hey, Eve? You know, you were the first one, right? Okay? You know, but no. He, he says, Adam, where are, he calls out to the man. Uh, do you believe for one second that, that God didn't know where Adam was? The all-knowing God of the universe? Adam, where are you? Well, he knew. Look at the next verse. Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I, there it is again, I did what? I I hid. And we've been hiding ever since. It's right there, ladies. Do you know why men are not all that good at intimacy? It's because intimacy is spelled into me see. And we're not sure you're going to like what you see. So we repress and we regress and we sweep it under the rug and we deny. So we play it hide and you have to seek us out. Number one, I hide my hurts. Number two, I need my space. Oh, yeah. I need a shed. I need a room. I need a garage. I need a uh, a media area. By the way, I absolutely, positively, 100%, as a pastor and a leader, can promise you the Atlanta Falcons will not lose today. Okay? And he said amen, right? Oh, by the way, it's a bye week. Just so you know, it's a a bye week. But so we need a place. We need a place to watch things. We, if, you haven't, if you haven't been aware of this, uh, Adam was in the Garden of Eden, and it was perfect. It was pristine. It was awesome. And then they, they screwed it up. They rebelled, and they messed us up. And so Genesis 3.23 records, so the Lord God banished him forever from the Garden of Eden and sent him out. And ever since he sent man out, we've been trying to get back in. One of the greatest memories that my wife and I have in our marriage is one night 
we weren't getting along really well, so she sent me out. And I did what every man should do. I got my five iron, crashed the window, and went back in. Because, because of fallenness, I've been sent out, but because of the redemption story, I went back in. And so I need my space. You see, a man moves into a home to habitate. A woman moves into a home to decorate. Do you know this? You know, they say a, a, man's, uh, a man's home is his castle. What that really says is we need our space. How many times have I heard one more piece, Stan, and we'll be done? And then at night I trip over a piece and go, where'd we get this? Why? Because men, we Home Depot, and they bed, bath, and to infinity and beyond. We habitate, they decorate. I hide my hurts, I need my space. The third and final thing, men, wish women knew, I live to work. Some of you men are working right now on your fantasy football team. You know who you are. You're working on work. You're working on some problems in your life or in your family. You're working on a solution to the leaves that have fallen. You're right now thinking of uh, after uh, church, after uh, lunch, I'm going to go to Home Depot or Lowe's and get a new leaf blower. And when a man has a leaf blower in his mind, nothing can imprint his brain, not even the Bible. If you have a problem, you're working on it. Men are always at work. Men at work. And something I've discovered over the years is that men tend to be at work thinking about their families when they should be at work thinking about work. And men tend to be at home thinking about work when they should be at home thinking about home. It's an odd thing. We are men at work. We even work at sports. You follow me around the golf course. I work at it. I take it very seriously. Follow me around fishing. And if you ever want to see a full contact sport, watch a church softball league. These guys will cuss you out in Jesus' name. <laughs> they put on shorts. Their Dunlap disease falls over their chest. It's crazy. So furthermore, in Genesis, we go back to the Genesis account. God blessed them and told them, multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. You are masters of the fish and birds and all the animals. In other words, take dominion over the fish of the sea. So when a man goes fishing, what does he need? He needs a $60,000 boat. And he needs a $50,000 pickup to pull the boat, right? And he needs all, and in the early service, uh, there were three men who said, amen, really loud. And he needs all the equipment that goes with it. No, but... It, but it's right there in the Bible, that we like to take dominion. We like to work at stuff. But deep down, here's what a man is really looking for, and we could do an entire series on this. Men want to be admired and respected, ladies. Paul addresses this in the same letter in Ephesians 5.33. So again, I say the wife must see to it that she deeply respects her husband, obeying, praising, and honoring him. And all the women said, not a chance. Listen, I read about a guy who was sick and went to the doctor. The doctor examined him, and it didn't look really good. The doctor said, I need to talk to your wife before I ever talk to you. The guy thought, oh, man, this is really bad. The doctor pulls the wife to the side and says, listen, you're going to have to cook him three great meals every day. You're going to have to fuss over him every day. You're going to have to make mad, passionate love to him every day for him to extend his life. Otherwise, he'll die really, really soon. So she goes out to her husband. And he looks like, mm, what is it? The doctor says, you're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die. So I hide my hurts. I need my space. I live to work. Now, what do women wish men knew? Sigmund Freud once said, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, I have not yet been able to answer the great question, what does a woman want? And yet, if we're supposed to be alert at noticing differences, we have to pay close attention. What do women want? I'm not going to profess to be an expert. Just talk to my wife. And there's no way. I have to turn it. So... What I'd like to do is make some suggestions based on some of the learnings I've had and what I'm still learning. Three things. Number one, men, women would want you to know I'm not a thing to be used. They are not some object. I know it's hard in our culture for us to believe this. 
This great process theologian Paul Tillich once said, the greatest threat to modern society is the thingification of people, turning people into things, into objects. Women were made by God and for God for the glory of God. They were not made to be an object for your pleasure. They did a survey of 1,000 women. They asked, which would you prefer, beauty or brains? 75% of the women chose beauty over brains. And when they were asked the rationale, they said, men can see better than they can think. (laughs) Probably true. Some of you know I pastored a church in South Florida, a very far from God culture, 96% unchurched. So people had been living in sin and rebellion for 40, 50 years. They came to faith in Christ. And often they didn't change overnight. I mean, spiritually for all of eternity maybe, but not immediately. The transformation takes some time. And so a number of people over the years would call themselves Christians and they would come up and say, hey, Stan, I'm sleeping with this girl and I'm praying for God's will between her and my wife. And I'm thinking, you need some help. No, you need a slap upside the head is what you need. Because women do not exist simply as an object or a thing to give them pleasure. It takes a woman to complete a man. Do what, pastor? I'm just going Bible on this one. When God created Adam and Eve, the Bible says that God found a helpmeet suitable, someone equal. There's literally, the Hebrew word means equal, not a helpmate slave, but a helpmate equal. Now, we've gone through a lot over the last decades in our history. And the feminist movement, actually brought some good things. It it raised the value of women in our culture. But it also said that everyone's equal and everyone's the same. No, not everyone is the same. In fact, I'm, I'm grateful for one that we're not the same. So ladies, you set the standard. You tell your daughters you are worth more than a thing being thingified by a boy and a toy. And you set the standard for your femininity and your virtue. Something else a woman might want you to know. I'm not a thing to be used. I want your presence, not just your presence. My wife and my girls don't just want what I earn or what I can buy for them. Those things are nice. They're great. but They're fine with that. But deep down, what they want is me. They want more of me. And for many women, love is spelled T-I-M-E. Listen to this right out of the Bible. This is in the Song of Solomon. These, this couple's living in bed together. One night my lover was missing from my bed. I got up to look for him but couldn't find him. I went into the streets of the city and the roads to seek him, but I searched in vain. The police stopped me and I said to them, have you seen him anywhere, this one I love so much? Get this image in your mind. Here's a woman running through the streets in her nightgown or her Victoria's Secrets. No wonder the police stopped her. And she says, have you seen him anywhere, the one I love so much? And then later, if you read read the story in Song of Solomon, it says, it was only after a little while that I found him and I held him closely and I would not let him go. And what that shows men is what women want and they need is our presence, just oftentimes to be there, to be with, to listen. I think women expect two things, be with it and be with us. Get your act together and come home. Here's the third thing. Not only do women say, don't treat me like a thing to be used, I want your presence more than your presence. I think women would say, I need your eyes to be my mirrors. Do what? So I was raised in a home with all boys, and then for the last 37 years, I've been in a home with all girls. Until seven months ago, or eight months ago, when our first grandson was born. And I see this in my house and saw this in my house, especially in in our our girls' growing up years, is there were mirrors all over the house. Just so you know, I never have to check my hair in the mirror. It's just, I walked to church today from over, way over in the park. My hair never got wet today. But my girls, when they would stop by a mirror, they would check it out. And there are some religions that are against makeup. That's not the religion that I have. I'm for it. I'm thankful for it. But my girls look in these mirrors, and I think what they want, they want me to be their mirror. They want me to say, you're my sunshine. You're my princess. You're beautiful. I love you. You're attractive. 
And again, I know this is simplistic, and this can be dangerous to say, what do men want? They want to be admired and respected. What do women want? Deep down, women want to be valued. They want to be appreciated, men. Women want to be loved. That's it. And the Bible teaches as a Christ follower, men, husbands, we are to love our wives the same way that Jesus loved the church, which is a tall order. He sacrificed everything for the church. He valued the church. It was his glorious bride. And you know how Jesus feels about the church. He loves it. It's a beautiful mess, but he loves it. And you know how he feels about us in this place of grace. He loves you. He loves me. He selected you. Even before you were in your mother's womb, God formed you and fashioned you. And God decided before you were born to pour out his love to you. And some of you weren't raised to know this. Some of you come into this place of grace and maybe you're new to our church since the summer or you're, you're just checking God out or you've been burned out on religion and you don't even think God could love you because of everything in your past. Or if he does, it's like your mother. He has to love you. No, God chose to love you. It's a crazy love. It's a passionate love. So, men, when it comes to the women in our lives, they need to look into our eyes, and we need to help them feel like they are it, man. I love you for who you are, not for what you're going to give me. The eyes are the mirrors. Okay, we're going to have to speed this along. I can see that. Uh, Everything you wrote down, you could just, like, X out almost right now and wipe it off the slate. And I've been dying to get here, and here's why. Men, there's no way that your spouse is ever going to meet your deepest longings and needs. Women, do I even have to say? Why? Because God never intended for us to fully meet each other's needs, to meet needs that only he can meet. The deepest needs, those empty places, those hiding places in my life, those feelings of not being respected enough, or attractive enough, or beautiful enough, or desirable enough, can only be met in the unconditional love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel truth. And some of us have been longing for all the fullness and all the satisfaction from our spouse. You cannot get everything you need from there. That is secondary. God is to be primary. He says, seek me first, and all these other things will come your way. Are you listening to me? They will never, ever completely satisfy you, and they were never intended to. So first and foremost, you've got to work on your relationship with God and then with others. Weird families work best with God's help when me is we. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. One more. What do kids wish their parents knew? And again, being a father is probably one of the highlights of my life. We had our first daughter, and we thought, oh, man, I'd have 10 of these. Then we had another child. (laughs) And having three daughters, I've learned a few things over the years. Let me give you three things, parents, grandparents. If you're taking notes, number one, I need to be loved. Kids need to be loved. And I can even tell in student ministry and sometimes with children around here, the kids who get love, the kind of love that a mom and dad should give, the nourishment, the environment, and the kids that aren't. Teachers can tell. Because a kid that is loved by a mom and a dad effectively and rightly has one quality that other kids don't have, confidence. And so our kids need to be loved. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 And now a word to you parents. Don't keep on scolding and nagging your children. How do I love my kid, pastor? Well, that's how not to. You don't love your child. There's times where you have to do these things. But if you continually scold and nag and scold and nag and preach at them or drone on and on about what they're not doing right, that's not love. Listen to this verse, how it plays out. Don't make them angry and resentful. Rather, bring them up with the loving discipline the Lord himself approves of. Kids want and need love. But there's a second thing they want, and some parents never give it. I need to be loved. I also need to be limited. Moms and dads, you have to put limits on your children. There's a constant tension between love and discipline. 
I've heard people say, well, I love my kids so much, I can't bear to discipline them. Are you kidding me? You're a chicken is what you are. Uh, did you know that your child doesn't have to be your best friend, your best buddy? Are you aware of this, moms and dads? Are you aware that there's going to be a time in your child's life where they will hate your guts and they'll get over it and so will you and that's okay? But they need boundaries. They need guardrails. They need safe spaces. Is if mom and dad don't set limits, who will? What do you need? To, you need to limit their fun. You need to limit what movies they go to. Did you know what? You need to limit their friends. The Bible says bad company corrupts good morals. You choose your friends. You choose your future. So if they've chosen the wrong friends, they chose the wrong future. Kids need to be limited. We need to limit these days their social media intake. We need to limit the channels they watch, the iPads, the smartphones, the Instagrams, the Snapchats, and whatever else just came out last week, whatever it might be. They need to be loved, but they need to be limited. This constant tug between love and discipline. You know, there's a third thing that a kid needs. I need to be led. Their children have, middle schoolers today have more choices than ever in the history of humanity. Think about this. When we were growing up, we had three choices on TV, ABC, CBS, NBC. Now we have 700 choices and nothing good to watch. And they have so many decisions that need to get made. How are they going to get made? I love that we could guide our children. We, our middle daughter, I still remember she was a sophomore in high school. She had 75 different college catalogs on her nightstand. How is she going to figure out which college to go to? Spin the college roulette? She's going to make the right choice because I'm going to help guide her. We are going to pray with her, and we're going to find out which one she can go to for free. That's how it works. <laughs> Moms and dads, here's something I've noticed over the years. This will freak you out. You do such a great job child rearing, and then your child gets in middle school or high school, and you disengage from parenthood. You think your job is done. You've only just begun. It's too soon to quit. Even at church, I see this all the time. Over the years, I would talk about how important it was for moms and dads to get their children in a consistent environment in We Rock, Kids Rock, in the children's area. And many parents would do that really well until middle school, high school. Hey, where's Billy? Hey, where's Jeff? Hey, where's Susie? Oh, they didn't want to come to church today. Really? If they said, no, I'm not going to go to school today, would you say, oh, that's fine? If they said, hey, it's midnight, I'm going to go out for a walk down Dallas Highway, would you say, yeah, go ahead? No. Parents. And over the years, I found it astounding is that we would, we would take kids to student camp where their whole trajectory of their life and eternity would be changed by Jesus Christ. It was a $300 camp. They would send their kid to band camp for $600 or to tennis camp for $600, get them involved in travel ball, but $300 to student camp? Oh, no, we're going to pass on that. Moms and dads, can I tell you, we are partnering with you to help raise a positive kid in a negative world. Let us. Bring them to Pipeline. When the awakening comes every single night, the more your students can be here, the life will be changed for all of eternity. And you'll look back and say, that was when God awakened us and them to the Spirit of God within us. I have never met a parent that regretted getting my student in the ministry at our church. But I've had dozens and dozens of parents say, Pastor, I didn't believe you. And we picked travel ball. And we pick this and that over Jesus. And I'm so sorry we did. We're paying the price now because they've gone down the wrong road. I need to be led. And we're going to wrap up with what we wish we all knew. What we wish we all knew. And there's two things, and then I'll be done. I need your applause, not your appraisals. I stand here every weekend or sit, and there's three different times where I get measured. And if I don't measure up, then I know some of you are going to go down to the next Baptist church, or you're going to go down to the next Methodist church, or you're going to go to some denominational church, or maybe you'll quit church altogether. And I understand that I'm being measured. But can I tell you that as a pastor, I am human too, and I need your applause, not just your appraisals. And that's the way you are too. 
You don't need someone to always be appraising you, appraising you, appraising you, nagging you, scolding you. You need someone to applaud you. And that brings us to the second thing we all need. I need lifts, not lectures. Hello? I don't need your opinion about the current cause of my greatest calamity. I need this. I need lifts. I need to be lifted up. In fact, in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, it says, you should not forsake the assembling of yourselves together for encouragement, just as you see the big day approaching, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we need one another, that we don't need to come together and cut each other down or gossip about one another. We need to, we need to lift one another up. Do you know anyone who doesn't need encouragement? Man, I love Sundays. I love I love being in a group because I need to be encouraged. And all of us need to be encouraged. And all I thought was this week, how can I, how can my weird family work better? Here's one way. When it's we over me. Not that I'm going to think less of myself, but I'm going to think of myself less. So I'm going to pour out myself more in acts of love. I want to be more alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. All over this room, can we bow our heads? And thank you for the gospel. God, thank you for the good news. Thank you that into our weird family, you, God the Father, sent your one and only son to a planet that was weirded out because of fallenness and brokenness and dysfunction. God, if we discovered anything this week, we discovered that what happens in Vegas doesn't necessarily stay in Vegas. That God, sin gets paid for and meted out. And I, for one, am so thankful that you decided to send your own son as our sinless substitute to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, to pay the ultimate price on a cross, to be raised from the dead by your power, to live evermore, to make an intercession and prayer for our weird families. Now you, men, women, parents, grandparents. The challenge before us is huge. The challenge of raising up children is big. The challenge of being married and staying married is a difficult challenge, but this is why we need Jesus. This is why we need the Holy Spirit of God into our weird family. We need God's grace sufficient for our time of need. And if you've got a family member something going sideways right now i want to pray with you and for you god thank you for these biblically based tools and research proven ingredients over these few weeks before thanksgiving that will help us discover how we can make our weird family work with your help first god help us pour ourselves out as men for our women and help women to try to respect their men and men try to love on their women, and parents to guide and provide for their children, maybe even better this week than last week. God, we're going to need your help. And God, we thank you for the opportunity we have here at this church to be a place of encouragement, to lift one another up, not cut one another down. And God, ultimately, most of us who are Christ followers, we live for an audience of one. We live for your applause. But we thank you in this life that we've got friends and family that we can encourage. Would you encourage someone today who's discouraged? God, someone who's been beaten down, would they stop the beatings? And Jesus, would you permeate into their life amazing grace into their hearts as we don't think less of ourselves, but as we think of ourselves less. Thank you for pouring yourself out to us with a great act of love, so sacrificial. In Jesus' name, we pray.